Mirror brings you after the bell in association with Betfair. Hello and welcome to this week's After the Bell. We're back on our usual Monday slot. I'm Martin Dorman, joined by Declan Taylor and George Groves. Once again, if you're on YouTube, please do hit the subscribe button. I'm afraid it wasn't the most vintage of Boxing Weekends, just the one show in London with Frank Warren. We're going to look back at that. We're mainly going to look ahead to next weekend when the boxing really gets started as Vasily Lomachenko takes on Teofimo Lopez and we also have another card in the UK. We'll then take a look at Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder. Something going on there. Hopefully we'll get to the bottom of it. And finally, Kel Brook training himself, promoting himself for his fight with Terence Crawford. Also some strange goings on there. Gents, how are we on this fine Monday morning? Very good. Not too bad. Excellent. Let's get started with Saturday night. Liam Williams took care of Andrew Robinson inside a round. I won't ask you what we learned from that fight because the answer, I assume, is very little. But what it does mean, of course, is that he is now, or still, mandatory to Demetrius Andre for the WBO middleweight title. For me, the, well, okay, let, let's assume that Andre takes the fight, we go into negotiations and it's dealt with. How do we see that fight going should it materialise? Going in George. I think um, Liam Williams is a is a very um, is a good fighter. You know, um, oh, a quick, a quick glance, like you think maybe he's not big enough to be a middleweight, um, or he's, he's not maybe not quick enough to compete with the, the elite level middleweights. Um, you just sort of do you want to box him in as like a, a tough brawler who. You know, we'll make it, probably give most fighters a hard night's work, but you know, we're not unsure of him at um, elite level. But I think he's proven now at 28 years of age, he's he's coming into the, the best boxing of his career. Um, he seems to be working well with with Dominic Ingle. Um, and he, I, th- I mean, I haven't seen the measurements. He looks like he's got real long arms. We know he we know he's strong and he and he hits hard. Um, and just from last night, it was. As you say, didn't, we didn't learn an awful lot from the fight. The, cl- the clash of heads was certainly um, a, f- a factor as such. But then once Williams started landing, um, it was sort of like a bit of a mismatch. So I think if he, you know, Andrade, I think uh, he's got a real, a real chance in against Andrade if he can get in there and, and um, make himself known. Um, Andrade is a, a fantastic, skillful fighter. You know, he has been. I remember seeing him. We went. I, I went to Texas in two thousand and four for like a Junior Olympic tournament or something like that. And he was out there, and he was he, he won he won the gold out there. So he's um he's been around for a long time now. Um, he might even have beat Sean Porter, I think, in that final. So it's going back some years, but he um good fighter, skillful fighter, but I think. Liam Williams would give him him a real hard night's work. Andre wasn't particularly convincing last time. Declan against Luke Keeler. I mean, started very quickly, but then sort of took his time to get him going and get the job done. Yeah, I mean, that's him all over, isn't it? It's a bit like, um, dare I say, a bit like James Ligo in that that sense where he often would take, he takes his foot off the gas and he's not, when it seems like he doesn't really need to. Like he did the same against... um, Isaac Corton Dockwa, remember the guy who came in when Billy Joe Saunders had to pull out of that fight, did the same, beat him up and then just cruised for like the last half of the fight. And it's like, what are you doing? Like people, especially in America, people don't like that at all. Um, and like George said, he's such a skillful, pure boxer, maybe one of the best there is now, like now, like Ward and people like that have gone, really. But he gets he gets pilloried because he can go dull in the, in the back end of fights or just switch off and because it, maybe it's because it's easy for him. Um, with Liam Williams won't make it easy for him, so maybe that's the sort of fight where we'd see the best of him. Or maybe that is a sign of some sort of, um, you know, that's a mental thing for him that he switches off. And that also means maybe he'd be um, prone to taking someone like Liam Williams lightly because he's never heard of him. I'm sure he's never really watched him. And Williams would be so up for that fight. Um, I don't know if it will happen next. I think what's on Liam Williams' side is that it doesn't look like the other fights that he wants, like Canelo or Charlo or 
even Saunders is still calling out, I've got to happen. So it's the sort of fight where you go, okay, cool, I'll just take my mandatory. Um, and I think with that in mind, Liam Williams have a big chance. It wouldn't be an easy, nice work for Andre, and that's what he likes. Um, but it's about how he step, stamps his authority on the fight, like he did with Keeler and Court and Dockwork, start really well, make an impression, and then maybe it's just his then to cruise home. But I don't see that being the case with Williams. George, if, if you're Andre, do you, as step says, just take the mandatory, get on with it? Or are you thinking, actually, this is my time now to try and pursue a bigger fight, get rid of the belt? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, as a fight, you'd always assume that they would always be pushing on to win new belts. That's that's a challenge. You know, that's, um, that's where you get into boxing for. But he's, his setup's a bit strange, uh, Andrade, in that it's, it's not that clear about which way he wants to go. Personally, that's how I, how I feel. He hasn't really... Um, Stake his flag in the ground to push for for them for them bigger fights properly. So, but at the same time, not one hundred percent interested in in a mandatory. I I think um, he will end up fighting Williams. I think that's probably the easiest fight to make, especially in the current climate. Um, so I, th- I think that that will probably be the next. But when it takes place, don't know. Everything's taking a little bit longer to to put in place. But um, I I think that's a much more likely instance than him challenging one of the other bigger names um, in the division, you know, or another champion. In most likely, can I just like... quickly before before we move on to that? Can I just say that um, really tip of the hat for Liam Williams has changed uh, Boo Boo Andrade to Poo Poo Andrade. <laughs> Which is some of the some of the finer trash talk I've heard for a while. I don't know where he's come up with that. Sensational. I hope we hear more of it. Poo poo Andrade. <laughs> I mean, if that's not getting him over in Rhode Island, absolutely pulling his hair out, I don't know what will. Well, if I wasn't already excited for the fight, which I'm exactly. not sure I was, then definitely now bring it on. So probably next year. I feel like the rest of this year is is chock a block actually with fights, which is which is great. So I think Williams probably have to wait maybe into February. Also on Saturday night, the return of Nathan Gorman, slightly bigger than he was before. Although, from what he said, actually, we were lucky, well, lucky enough to see him that way. It seems like he piled on four or five stone over lockdown. He took on Richard Larty, who really had a name because he dared to trade with Daniel Dubois for a few seconds last year, ultimately winning on points. Again, Declan, probably more just good for Nathan Gorman to overcome whatever demons were still there a little bit, get back in the ring. And now, if he's true to his word, he pushes on, loses more weight and see something like what he used to, to give. Yeah, he was he was obviously totally convinced that he was going to beat Dubois based on their spar and all that sort of stuff. And obviously he was beaten so conclusively. Uh, it's, a, it's impossible for people like me and you, Martin, to really understand what that must feel like, being a, you know being a fighter and going in and then getting beaten like that and then having to try and c- come back. So credit to him, he is back. Okay, he's overweight. I think that wasn't the test of whether he's back or not, to be honest. I think the next one and then the next one really is to see what long-standing effect that Dubois fight had on, on him. Um, he's still skilled, you know, skilled for heavyweight. His, his left hand was really nice last night. His jab was great. I'm sure George would have appreciated that. Um, and yeah, he did what he, he did what he had to do. Uh, obviously, he didn't get the stoppage like Dubois did. Um, I think with Gorman at the moment, he's a solid domestic heavyweight. Um, we're talking about elite heavyweights at the moment in terms of world level. It's, it's really strong. So it's hard for anyone to break into that. He's not, I mean, the extra weight notwithstanding, he's not the biggest heavyweight and he's not a con- massive concussive puncher. So he has to deal with other things. But I still think there's money to be made, big fights for him, even just domestically. And then who knows, like you put, you put a run together, you never know what might happen. But um, yeah, I think the next one from here is the one when he's got, you know, the lockdown excuse maybe is gone and he's had this one under his belt. He's, you know, he's back out, out under the lights. His next one's the one where we're going to really learn about him, I think. I mean, you, you have to take your hats off to him for taking the Dubois fight in the first place, I suppose, George. And at that stage in their careers, there's, there's obviously going to be a winner and a loser. And for the loser, it is about... Looking, you can look at other fighters who have, who rack up the victories and you know go twenty and zero without ever facing anyone. You don't want someone to be punished for taking that chance a bit earlier in the career. No, definitely not. And um, 
saying that I wasn't aware of at the time, but um, read an article this week that you know he's um, Nathan Gorman's son wasn't wasn't very well. He was in and out of hospital throughout his um, you know his prep for um, Dubois, which must have had an effect, even if he wants to try and be the, the you know the ultimate professional. Um, that would have been difficult to contend with. Losing is never <laughs> never nice, uh, especially when you feel you're still in the the building phase, you know, you're not at world title level, you're still, you know, domestic title level, even though you're fighting another prospect who will fully go on to, uh, you know, world title level. Um, but they took, they t- he took that risk and he wanted, he wanted it to pay off. He backed himself and then having the, you know, you know, <laughs> the, the lockdown period, no doubt. Um, just you're fed up with, you're probably fed up with boxing and he's piled on the weight. Um, Every fighter who isn't a heavyweight has that anxiety of, well, I can't get too heavy because I've, you know, I've got to get it back off again. Heavyweights don't have that that concern, so they can put on five stone <laughs> or whatever it may be, um, and then obviously they've got to get it back off again. But it's not good for the body. Um, he looked he looked very deconditioned. You know, he, he's not a big enough man to carry that sort of weight. I think, but this might be just the, just a sort of wake up call. It might just feel like, oh well, I got that under my belt now. I got fit enough to fight. I'm back back to winning ways. Knuckle down and um, and push on from there because he is a very good fighter, um, and he can be involved in some some really interesting um, fights domestically. And then if he gets through them, then maybe even at a higher level. But um, you know, good good for him to get back get back out with him. Um, you know, not not a, you know necessarily a vintage performance. I think he, he took a couple of shots there where, he, as I say, he probably was heavier. You know, not as mobile, not as agile as he's used to. But you know, he's got himself fit, as I say, and um, you want to push on from there. There was, of course, also a victory for Willie Hutchinson, the super middle Scottish super middleweight who continues. He looks so, he looks great, doesn't he? But he just he needs he needs to step up now. He does, and, and actually, I did think that fight might go a bit longer than than around, but yeah, definitely. And, and what I was pleased to see actually is that he was just over the super middleweight limit, having talked a lot in the past about yeah, yeah, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do one six eight, but then always coming in around one seven five. So definitely, if he can squeeze in one more into this year, hopefully in another step up. Moving on to a real step up, Teofimo Lopez next weekend, this weekend, he takes on the lightweight king, Vasily Lomachenko. Technically, I mean, this should be for the undisputed lightweight champion. Unfortunately, technically it's not because Lomachenko was elevated by the WBC, so he's not actually their world champion anymore. But the other three belts on the line. First off, Declan, is this a step too far too soon for... Mr. Lopez, um, I think I think this is a massive fight that is based on weight in both directions. So I think that Lopez, I remember speaking to him uh, in New York. I think it was the Khan Crawford week, and he was doing the rounds, speaking to all the media. And there, that then that was last year. He said, by the end of this year, I've got to be gone from lightweight because I'm grow. He's young, obviously, and he's growing, and he's just too big for the weight, and he just can't do it anymore. So now we're talking getting on for 18 months after that and he's still down here because of because of all sorts of factors. One be they wanted the Lomachenko fight and they didn't want to move up before they got it because it's a big money fight and everything else. Um, so I wonder what the effect the weight is going to have on him that he is still getting down to that. He's posting all the right things and check weights and he looks great and all that sort of stuff, but you don't really know. On the flip side, Lomachenko really is not a lightweight. You know, he's gone he's gone up. He's one example of those guys who has looked through the weights to try and get bigger challenges like, you know, someone like Roberto Duran did. The opposite of someone like Golovkin, for instance, who just like, no, I'm a middleweight, this is me, this is what I'm going to dominate, but at the expense of missing out on bigger fights, which might have added to his legacy. So Lomachenko's done the opposite of that, but what we've seen in history and all the time is that in the end, you end up getting beaten by the weight. You get you, you get someone massive who's also good, um, maybe not as good as you if you were the same size, but you've got a massive puncher in, in Lopez, fearless guy. Um, so that's why it's such a such an intriguing fight. It's impossible to say if it's too early for Lopez. I feel like it is. If I was putting money on it, I'd be backing Lomachenko. 
for me, I know it's a bit unfashionable to say these days, but he's still my number one pound for pound, I would say. And I don't see him losing this fight, but he does get caught. He got floored by Linares. Campbell touched him a couple of times. And Lopez is a massive puncher. I remember thinking he'd struggle with Richard Comey and he didn't. He knocked him out. So if he lands, and to be honest, you'd think he will land at some point, he's got a chance of winning this fight by knockout, which is incredible. And then he is the biggest, biggest, you know, outside of Canelo, he's the, one of the biggest draws in the whole world. Like, what a victory that would be. It's just a great fight. It's the sort of fight, I know we moan a lot, it's the sort of fight we hang around for, isn't it? This, this sort of one, it doesn't come around very often. And for me, it is for all the belts because, yeah, okay, he's franchise champion, but he's the, he's the man of WBC. Oh, yeah, of course, there's no doubt that the winner is the man. It's just unfortunate that we have a franchise champion, a world champion, and if we don't already, an interim champion when Luke Campbell fights. George, do you see, I mean, of course, Lopez is a classy fighter, but ultimately, do you see the class of Lomachenko prevailing? Do you know what? I think this could be the banana skin for Lomachenko. I don't know why, um, but I like this Lopez. He's, the win over Comey was was brilliant, you know. I and Comey Comey knows he knows how to get on, how to navigate himself around a ring. Um, and um, speaking to um, a member of Comey's team, and after that fight, and he's just like he just didn't know what hit him, you know. Um, and as we as you, as you really well uh, brilliantly said earlier, Dick, like. Every now and again, you know, these great fighters get beaten by the weight. And I think um, he's not a huge lightweight, um, Lomachenko. Um, I felt that would have been, that was where Campbell needed to capitalize, you know, to, um, you know, put his his strength um, and his size against Lomachenko. And at times he looks so much smaller and, yeah, sure. He's, he's definitely can whack um, Lomachenko, and when he puts the shots together, and he you know he takes an angle, it's like it's like having a free shot. So you you might not even buzz someone; you might just momentarily stun them. But then you took an angle, and you you're on the blind side, and you're letting the next wave of shots come. He's got every shot in the book. So, but if 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 uh, if Lopez hits him, catches him, hurts him. Um, I, he looks like a real good finisher, a real good finisher. Mm. Um, Lomachenko, I mean, he hasn't really put a foot wrong, in, you know, since since he's been at the, since he's become world champion. But I don't know, there there is that slight vulnerability about him, you know, that um, and it might just be not 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 the case. Um, he looks susceptible to a body shot. Sometimes he gets hit, you know, for like a body shot or you know, one round behind the elbow goes in and. He has the rest of the round off, um, but he does have that amazing ability to just give you a different look continually throughout the entire fight. So, if you get if if you're Lopez and you get a big right hand that lands over the top, um, that shot might not be there for you for the rest of the round because Lomachenko will give you a totally different look. Um, that's what he does so well. Um, he's an all action fighter when he wants to be. But uh, I don't know, man. I ain't gonna back against. I want to hear the odds for this one. I ain't gonna back against Lopez on this one. If there's great odds, then this is gonna be the one where just maybe. I mean, it's over. It's over twelve months now. Um, Lomachenko yeah. camp. He's not getting any younger, is he? He's not getting, he's not getting any, younger. any younger. Over twelve months. I mean, he's definitely a guy who just lives in the gym. You know, if he's not, if he's not doing punching drills, he's practicing, he's juggling or, you know, his handstands or whatever else he's, you know, he's doing that week. He's all... Sounds like Martin. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I missed that one. It, sound, it sounds like Martin juggling and doing handstands. Yeah, well, they got, you got to have some sort of training partner, I suppose, or whatnot. I don't know. Martin, <laughs> let, Martin let us know about that. But, um, yeah, after this, you know, after this amount, this, this amount of time out of the ring, who knows? Who knows? I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, nothing against Lomachenko. He wowed me. We went to the the junior, the junior world championships, um, two thousand and five or two thousand and six in Agadir in Morocco, and um, he 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 won the gold uh, in that tournament. The the Cuba sent a team of six. They won five golds and a silver. The only Cuban to get beat was beaten by 
a 51 kilo Ukrainian who boxed orthodox in the prelims, the quarters and semis, and in the final box southpaw and stopped the Cuban 20 point rule. It's like, that's not even fair. <laughs> that's impossible. We're standing around scratching our heads and what's the point? Um, so at that point, celebrating people like Amir Khan going, you know, this is, this is the future. And then this little chap, Lomachenko, shows up. I thought, he might be one to remember. And he did, he cropped up a few years later. <laughs> I, think, like, I think what's also interesting with this fight is like, we saw it in the Nicholas Waters fight, didn't we? And, well, he did. They had that long list of people quitting on him, no Mashchenko and stuff. That what's going to be interesting, and it's similar when we'll talk about this later um, or another week, Ryan Garcia against Luke Campbell. But when these young fighters who haven't have basically had it their own way and they've been stepped up really nicely and have just been knocking everyone out who's turned up, what happens when they get into round eight, nine, ten? They're still unable to land the shots like they usually have when everything they try, all their usual back backups and all their usual tricks are just not working, then what does he do? Because Nicholas Waters couldn't land a glove on him and just had to get home, go back, you know, go home and get out of that ring as quickly as he can. You've got a young guy who's relatively inexperienced, uh, who won't never have had that before, where three, four, five rounds have gone past and nothing's working, then what does he do? So it's going to be really interesting test of his character as well. If he lands in the second round and knocks him out, okay, but... You know, what if he doesn't? I, I can't wait for it. I can't wait for it. Um, yeah. What are the odds then? Hit us. Well, if you do, if you're with George and you see Lopez coming through, he's 11 to 4 with Betfair. Lomachenko, mm. the 4 to 1 on favourite, the draw 22 to 1. Have you got Never. stoppage odds? Oh, Declan. <laughs> I'm just spot. thinking, I don't see. I don't see Lopez winning. I don't see Lopez winning by uh, inside. The, uh, I don't see Lopez winning a decision. I think if it goes the distance, Lomachenko will have won the fight. Is my feeling. Mm -hmm. um, but well, because I'm good to you, who knows? Yeah. So on, Lopez by stoppage four is a mad price anyway. Lopez by stoppage is four to one. Okay, so it's just oh, under three. Have you for got a round bet in there as well, mine? Have you got oh. a round bet? <laughs> Do you want me to make your breakfast for you as well? <laughs> <laughs> what was that? What round, George? Three to six. Three to six. Oh, now that's if he were, if he was to win in rounds three to six, that is what a statement that would be. That would be incredible. I give you four to six. It's sixteen yeah, to yeah, one. That's what I mean. Sixteen six, to one. Sixteen. Yeah. Wow. Sixteen. Yeah. That's what I'm going with. It's also I've got my pound it's ready. It's impossible, isn't it? It's impossible to know what um, what age does to people until they're in the ring. I know it's an old adage, you know, people get old overnight in the ring, but um, it's impossible to know. He's been out of the ring a long time. He's old. He's been going like you said there. Look, that was years and years and years ago. Amateur, you know, one of the greatest amateurs in history. Long career, so much fighting. It's like it can't go on forever. But I think he's got he's got this one under his belt. Of course, if you want to watch it in the UK, you have to. Well, I'm not saying ten pounds is, is a lot of money for it. I think you know we'd pay a lot more for a lot worse. However, I'm happy with that. Should we be disappointed that it's on Fight TV? Yeah, we should be complaining that the two channels, main channels, who take a subscription fee from boxing fans, claim to be in boxing and have the sports best interests at heart. Neither of them picked up the best fight of the year. It's absolutely crazy. I can't believe. I know it's lean times, and that you know people were losing their jobs and all that sort of stuff. But this is like the best fight that they could possibly have wished to pluck from America. Neither of them bothered. I'm just glad that someone has and we can watch it and we're not having to try and scratch around for a link. So good on Fight TV and hopefully they make a few quid out of it. Why not? And I'm, I'm happy to pay 10 quid for a fight like this. I'm not happy to pay for pay-per-view when they're gone. We've got a pay-per-view date. Let's try and form a card around it. That's not how it works. But I'm happy to pay if it means that someone like Fight TV will 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 broadcast it for us. Um, but yeah, Sky and BT, it's, just, it's a real shame neither of them got this one. George, I know you were retired last year when the Campbell fought Lomachenko, but I think Ram Wright and saying you're still sort of close with, with, with Shane McGuigan and that sort of team. Did, did you get a sense of how Campbell thought he could upset Lomachenko, what his sort of game plan was and why he was confident, as I assume he was? Yeah, I started off at, this, at the start. <laughs> I was in a bit, but then I... I I left them. I sort of left them to it. So I didn't see too much of um, the gym work. Um, but well, yeah, flaked, flaked in and out. I was there at fight week. Um, 
<clears throat> I think obviously the, 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 their plan didn't, didn't quite come off and I remember Luke saying that everything every time he had success it wasn't there the second time you know um and my, my, you know, being such an overwhelming underdog in the build-up to this fight and, you know, to be um, fighting in the UK on a pay-per-view show and people just being super excited that Lomachenko's there when we've got Campbell, who's British, Olympic champion, um, could go out there and do something different. I was a bit disappointed that um, we couldn't just get a little bit more momentum. Since like everyone else who's up against it, um, who's maybe a Brit as a big underdog, um, you know, people are believing in him, and, and I feel like that could have been had an added uh, an added advantage for Campbell come time he boxed. Um, but <laughs> for me personally, maybe I was being biased. I was on the inside. Just thought not enough people believe that you know Campbell Campbell is good. He had a big size advantage. He probably you know he can hit. He can definitely hit hard. Campbell, whether he hits hard in Lomachenko or not, I don't know. But I feel like um, Campbell being a southpaw, we, they were looking at um, landing his. Um, Shots to the body, long, loose, bolo, bent arm shots to the body, and um, just not being static with with Lomachenko because the second he becomes static, he can then hit and take that and take those angles. Um, he will do it all night long. But also, if you're a bigger guy, you want to be able to press him. So you don't really want him just having all that freedom and all that time to, you know, either take take a take a rest or recompose himself or think of the next attack. Well, just to keep you guessing, um, you don't want to be wasting shots or just trying to keep busy by letting your hands go because then he'll be able to counter off them. But, you know, I'd be marching him down, stepping to him with a defensive frame of mind where you're anticipating something coming back. You might even be anticipating him taking an angle, but continually trying to give him something to think about. So it's working off, if you're southwest, working off the lead, the lead hand, you've got that, that height and range to have that element of safety, um, slip and slide, but without that static tight. The second you start standing still, he's going to attack and then take an angle. Or if you just feed him rubbish shots that you can see coming and he's got nothing to worry about, then again, he'll take an angle off them and hit you or just straight up, just punch with you or, you know, he can do anything. So I think if you're a big puncher like Lopez, you want to be off the off the front foot, dangerous, um, meaningful, without wasting shots. But um, yeah, more so than anything, just, just don't have that low in concentration, that switch off, because someone like that will always be able to take full advantage of it. And he's a great finisher himself, Lomachenko, fantastic finisher. So when he does get guys hurt, he can put the shots together. Even if the fight don't finish there and then, you know, um, some damage will be done that we you know, eating into the energy reserves or, you know, into something else where it pays dividends as the fight goes longer. So, um, really good fight. Really, really good fight. Absolutely. And as we said, that is on Fight TV, F-I-T-E dot TV, 9.99, early hours of Sunday morning. Definitely one, of course, we'll be picking apart next week. What is on Sky next Saturday night is the return of Lewis Ritson in a much-delayed fight against Miguel Vasquez. Of course, difficult to get as excited about this one very much. Although what I will say about this fight, it's probably given the situation in the super lightweight division, we now believe Josh Taylor will fight Jose Ramirez for all the belts next year. So at some point, let's say Taylor wins, then fights Capital. At that point, the belts will probably splinter. So maybe for me, Although Miguel Vasquez is not the best opponent, Ritson, if he buys his time for 12 months, works his way into a mandatory slot, probably try and engineer a world title shot 12 months or so, Dan, you don't reckon? Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm not, it depends, doesn't it? It depends on what happens here because um, it's not a fight that massively excites me. Um, um, but Lewis Ritson, it's a big, it's a big test for him. Vasquez, it was three years ago since he lost to Josh Taylor. He's since lost to O'Hara Davis. And now it's like, okay, what's he got left? I thought he was much older. He's only 33. I thought he was much older than that. So, yeah, Richard's got to be winning this sort of fight in style. He's got to be winning well. And then who knows what happens when the belt's fragment. He's got to be in position for him, though. Josh, the one thing Lewis Richardson wouldn't have, of course, is his legion of fans 
you know, he sort of built himself up to be one of the more popular fighters, then had that setback. The European title, I believe, has rebuilt recently. As, as Dex said, I can't get particularly excited about this fight. I imagine Ritson will do what do enough against Vasquez, who in his in his day was excellent. I remember when he fought Josh Taylor, that was seen as a test um, for Taylor, but of course he was coming up. Now I think three years on, not so much. Mm. T- Taylor, I think, was about ten or no or something, and yeah. this was like one of his bigger steps up against um, someone who he was definitely a favourite in against, but would ask questions of him. And he done really well, um, Taylor. And then the O'Hara Davis fight, I don't think I saw, um, so I'm not sure how that how that fight went. But obviously, so Vasquez, has, he's got two losses in the UK against British fighters. Um, Ritson's now just got to go in there and um, do an even better job. Like that's how I used to see it as the, you know, it's it's almost like an element of risk really when you're fighting someone who's already been beaten. Uh, people have seen how to beat this guy, you know, in the UK. Um, so you've got to go out there and do an, an even better job. He's going to be confident because, you know, there's pr- there's proof there that these guys have already beaten him and. You're right. There. He's only he's only 33. Even though I I myself also thought he he must be older, um, but you know it's a good a good good skill for Mexican fighter. But I think Ritz Fitzen should probably just march for him with, with a crowd on his side or not. Um, you know I think. And then yeah, and then yeah, within you know who knows what the um, the like, well, weight division is going to take on next. Um, I know Josh Taylor had ambitions to, to clean up and then move up um, and he won't be looking to hang around um, so yeah if that I mean if that happens then within 12 months you're in a position that there could be multiple options there for you to challenge for a world title um, and Ritson being a, a fan a fan, real fan friendly fighter can you imagine if he did get a world title shot and we were allowed to let people watch it live um, <clears throat> It'll be a huge, huge event up in um, the north of England. Yeah, that's the thing with him, isn't it? It's like he was tearing through people. He was so exciting to watch. Obviously and understandably, the defeat against Patera took the wind out of the sails massively, but he has rebuilt. But let's not forget, you know, he's so, so exciting, so, like you say, fan-friendly, massive puncher. I think what he had on his side was that he could draw these crowds in, which obviously puts the, puts the gate up, puts the money up, and then a champion or a big name would be tempted. I remember they were talking about pro grade at St. James's Park. Like It seems like another lifetime ago they were talking stuff like that. But the point is, he's got a big, he's a big draw and he's real exciting. Um, so I think, you know, I think he's only a couple of wins away from being right up there. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, you probably shoot me down for this. I still wouldn't mind seeing the O'Hara Davis fight. I'd love to see a bit of that. I think that'd be good fun. Um, and I think they'd make a lot of money on that. You know, relatively money in these times. But, um, yeah, he's got to do a job, though, hasn't he? Because people are expect people are looking at this and turn their nose up half and going, well, OK, Vasquez is finished sort of thing. So it's up to Britain to, to really, really put a show on. There is a world title fight on the undercard. Savannah Marshall takes on Hannah Rankin for the WBO middleweight world title. Hannah Rankin has been, has been a world champion before... Once or twice, depending on how you rate the IBO. Savannah Marshall in just her ninth fight. Dave, you, you are keen on this fight. I'm, mm. so it, to me, it speaks a lot about this, the, the state of the, the women's game. It seems very easy to move up and down in weights and sort of find world title shots. This fight was made post-pandemic, if you like. It wasn't supposed to happen before. But you, you're quite keen on it. Yeah, I think it's good because I, I think the main thing, well, first of all, Savannah Marshall been crying out for her to have a real step up because she's a really talented fighter. Um, and so far, her pro career has been pretty easy pickings and therefore it hasn't really got the got the juices flowing how they should because she was one of our only ever am- world amateur champions. She's the only one in, in the world to have beaten Caressa Shields. And this is a big... It's finally a fight that we can get get excited about, get our teeth stuck into, because we've spoken about it before that women's boxing needs rivalries, needs opponents. There's no good. Okay, we hear that, you know there's champions everywhere, but never heard of them. Don't know what they're like. Never seen them. Don't know who they've boxed. It's now we're starting to get these these matchups like 
Jonas Harper and, you know, Taylor against Cameron, for instance, you know, think actual fights where people could in the pub, if, you know, only with you and five mates, no more, but, you know, in the pub and going, oh, have you heard of this? Fight? What do you think of that? You know, and what you need that for women's boxing, we need rivals and opponents. And I think this is a good one. It's a step up for Marshall. Rankin's been there and done it. Okay, a, a record suggests that she's not right there because she obviously lost her shields and whoever else. But um, so it's a big, it's a big test for Marshall. I'm really excited about it. Yes, it's for a vacant, a vacant world title, which is, um, you know, like you mentioned, it sort of seems to be they're, they're up for grabs a lot. The same with Bridges and Ball, uh, which is on that triple header. They sort of can get world titles from anywhere because there's a lot of vacant ones at the moment. I'm not that interested in that title. Okay, the, the winner will be the champion or a world champion, but I'm I'm really excited about the fight. I think it's a good one. Um, I don't know what it is about the bigger weights as well in women's boxing, but there seems to be far more activity, l- lower and more um, co- competition. So maybe that's the problem for Marshall and um, ranking. So to get them together, I think hats off. It's a good, it's a real good undercard fight. Uh, both Lewis Ritson and Savannah Marshall are heavily odds on nine to one on to win their respective fights. And their opponents, Michael Vasquez and Hannah Rankin, are five to one. We're just going to finish with a look back at what's been making the news in boxing this week and yet another development of sorts in the Tyson Fury Deontay Wilder trilogy fight. Reports over the weekend that the fight is off for this year, and therefore that means it's off completely. Frank Warren's alluded to their being some sort of date in a contract that means once that's passed, they're no longer fight. He hasn't explicitly said that, and Deontay Wilder's team has said that's nonsense and they want to fight this year anyway. I, I don't see, George, how they can fit it in. They've already said they can't do December 19th. They're not going to do Boxing Day, I assume. Mm-hmm. And every other weekend, there are pay-per-views all over the shop in America, which I assume they don't want to clash with. Are you, from, from your time in boxing, did rematch clauses or... Any clause have an expired date? Is that is that such a thing that happens, or do you think there's maybe some games going on? <clears throat> Anything can get signed into a contract. I, my uh, ed, well, my, my guess would be that Tyson Fury doesn't want to fight Deontay Wilder again. Doesn't want to do that camp again. Wants to move on. Wants to fight some bigger names. Wants to, you know, maybe even try and set up the fight with Joshua, which at whatever point. You know, and negotiations keep coming to a halt because he's got this this um, rematch clause looming over him. They they never really go away. If you're signed into a rematch clause and you're Deontay Wilder, you're not going to let it go. You could say, "I don't want to fight now," and um, and there's an extension on it to allow you know Fury to fight someone else, and then you fight the winner. Um, it can end up a real um, sticky mess at times and obviously you've got to bring into play the, the governing bodies and you know, in this case it'd be WBC to be like okay we're going to give um, <clears throat> Fury a voluntary but if he loses voluntary then the winner is going to have to fight Wilder and uh, you know it, it'll be there it'll be there forever probably until these guys fight um, unless they're going to try and buy Wilder out of the clause but m- my guess would be that Fury just can't be bothered to to do the to do the camp to get to mentally get himself around fighting someone who he's fought twice already and in the last fight felt he beat conclusively. Probably thought that was that was done now and he can move on. And um Wilder's just maybe a, a little bit crazy in that no one really knows what's going on at the moment. He might not even know. One minute he might want the rematch, one minute he might not. Um he's had a change up within his team. So maybe he's listening to different people now as well. So I don't know. Um, don't want to be miserable, um, but I'm like, <laughs> I'm not too fussed about it anymore. Heavyweights yeah. or not, you know, um, let's just, let's just, let's just move on. Yeah. You know, Fury, I'd like to see him fight someone else. If I'm truly honest, um, another contender, whoever wants to step up and, and, and have a go. Um, but yeah, if there's going to be news in the heavyweight division, I think they've announced um, Joshua P- Pulev now, which is going to be at the O2 um, at the end of the year. So no doubt Fury will follow suit. They they usually do. Um, there will be there will be something announced real soon. But yeah, um, Wilder before before the end of the year. You're right. I, I don't see how 
they've got time to put that together now. I just, I just don't. But even if it's not Wilder, then who's it going to be if Fury going to fight before the end of the year? Unless they've got something that they're ready to announce that they have to get the the Wilder problem sorted first. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Tyson Fury certainly seems to. Well, he's desperate to fight this year. That seems nailed on. Day. But we're not. To me, that means an Otto Wallin or you know a Tom Swartz. Yeah. Hopefully not a Pianetta. But you know, from fans, from a fans' point of view, of course, we'd rather just see a takeover fight from Fury, Wilder, step aside or whatever that situation is, and then that clears one more hurdle to Fury Joshua next year. Yeah, I'm not really sure how many left the ESPN contract. I'm not sure how the money works for it, but you would have to assume that he's getting less. He would get less in this this. Uh, time when we've got no gates than he would for the for the rematch, which also had a big pay per view excitement and buzz. The third fight just wouldn't. So would he fight Wilder for smaller money, or would he just go and fight someone that he would beat easily for similar money and then move on to the massive one against Joshua, where less chance of getting knocked out, getting cut, getting injured, and then go into the biggest fight in British boxing history, the biggest money, whether it's in England or Saudi or wherever it is. I can sort of understand what he's thinking and the, the play there, but I do think there's something still to come. I think there's a couple of little notes left on the story. I don't know what it is, but I don't quite buy that it's just falling out of bed and everyone's moving on. But let's see. I think the next couple of weeks will be key, but fitting it in now between before the end of the year is seems like a struggle. But, I mean, it's still bigger than a lot of the pay-per-views that we're, that we're seeing. I mean, it's bigger than Joshua Pulev, for instance. So... Maybe they wouldn't mind doubling up or, you know, or thinking of something creative. I'm not sure. But, I mean, I'm a bit like George. I'm sort of a bit bored of Wilder Fury now. I hate to say it because it's such a big fight, but there are other fights that get me more excited. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not sure this will be one of them, but we are going to finish on Calvary Terms Crawford. Not so much the fight itself that looks set to happen mid-November, but, again, another interesting situation in terms of Calvary's training situation has been very fluid for, for a couple of years seemed to be back as far as I was concerned with Dominic Ingle, but now Dominic Ingle's come out and said, no, I, I couldn't do a 12-week camp with him. He only has six. So I've said, no, I, I don't know what Kyle Brooks... He's negotiated this fight himself. He's not with him anymore. It's not gone through Sky. He's very much gone his own route. This seems a risky plan. Not for me to judge, but it a, seems a risky plan, Dave. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, as far as I know... Matchroom don't have real contracts with anyone apart from Joshua. I don't know if George, I don't know if that was the same for you when you when you were with Matchroom, whether you signed officially or exclusively. Obviously, that means it's fluid for for her and a Matchroom, but it also means that a boxer can go and chop around. To be honest, and I remember again that that Crawford Khan fight. Kel Brook was there. We were like, "What are you doing here?" And he's like, "Oh, they're talking about maybe me fighting me fighting um, Terence Crawford." And this was nothing. It was totally totally separate from Matchroom. And fair play to him, go, going to get a big fight. But yeah, the, the training situation is weird, isn't it? Because he seems to have got all the weight. He looks in great shape from what I've seen. And he's done all of that in the Ingle gym. But now he's left again. Um, uh, I mean, it's a, big, it's a big risk for it. I don't say risk. I mean, it's a tough, tough fight, isn't it, Terence Crawford? I can't say I give him much of a chance. But stranger things have happened. He's a, if he's on it, um, I do worry about him not having a trainer. Who's he going to be with? But... Yeah, I think fair play for shopping around and going to get a deal, get, getting paid by top rank. I mean, what it does mean, it's probably not going to be on Sky, so because um, they've got a lot of pay per views, they probably don't have space for it. But yeah, is that is that as far as you know as well, George? With the contract, is basically non contract and will fight comes. Well, yeah, not not everyone, but um, probably probably Kelbrook. Yeah, is is a situation where it's you know. You can you can do you can do what you like here. Uh, Matchroom probably trying to sign up as many heavyweights as possible as opponents more than anything else for Joshua and um, yeah for Joshua really. Um, and then some of the prospects will be under under contract. But yeah, a lot a lot of the other fighters are you know just um, ad hoc. They've <laughs> you can go where you like because um, they've got such a. Such you know, such an established setup now in the UK, Matchroom that you know 
they're, they're able to pay good money and get you the exposure that you need and therefore get you the bigger fights. Um, I'm not sure if it was if it was on, on the show or somewhere else. I heard that Kell Brook's fight um, was going to go uh, head-to-head with um, Dillian White versus Povetkin too. And um, Shiz- uh, I suppose um, you got Chisora versus Usyk pay-per-view coming up. You've got Joshua um, Pulev pay-per-view coming up. They're, it they couldn't fit in another pay per view for Kell Brook when that's it's, it's a tremendous fight, you know. It's it's, it's a great world title fight, um, but they've edged towards the heavyweights, so it, you know it's not going to go to whether it ends up on BT or not. I'm not sure, but, but yeah, he's gone to the top top rank and um, might be just fighting as an away fighter, just as an, an opponent, um, Matram or whoever Kell Brook's management is might not necessarily have much of the deal. So he's like, well, we'll do it, we'll do it ourselves. Um, it's a great fight against Crawford. You know, <laughs> might be his toughest fight yet. Who knows? You know, and you think he's already fought Golovkin and uh, and Spence, but um, this might be his, his toughest fight yet. It won't be 100% switched on for it, but um, great fight. Absolutely great fight. Crawford, one of the best in the business right now. And Kelbrook, you know, um, on his day, one of the best in the UK, Definitely. I think the two losses against Golovkin and Spence um, really took its toll on him um, with the injuries, the eye injuries that he had back to back. Um, but absolutely bizarre him, you know, being an undefeated welterweight champion, like doing the best we got. And then <laughs> someone, the fight is always going to want to fight everyone. It's up to the people yeah, around yeah. him to say, I think that's a really stupid idea to go up two weight divisions and fight the most frightening middleweight in the world right now um, and get his eye socket broke. But, um, you know, it wasn't... Everyone was shrugging their shoulders going, he's got nothing to lose, you know. If he loses, well, he has got a lot to lose. <laughs> he lost the, he almost lost his sight. So, um, no, right, ran over. He's like, but this is a great <laughs> fight against Crawford. Um, do, you, do, you think, do you think it would be... Um... The best win of Terence Crawford's career beating Kelbrook. When you think about his record, he hasn't. He's missed the whole point. He's not with the PBC, so he's missed the likes of Thurman Porter, obviously Spence. So Kelbrook, for me, he's like maybe the best win on his record if he goes and beats a, a good version of Kelbrook. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I haven't got his record in front of me, annoyingly, but former world champion, um, good fight. And yeah, if Kelbrook is in in form, he's a tough. He's a tough he's a tough opponent isn't he um he can punch hard technically very good fast hands um good boxing iq experienced and competed at the highest level um yeah fair, fair, fair enough statement tech without um without unless, they, unless he's got a win over Usyk that i haven't got I've, I've missed out somewhere or he beat duran before duran finished up um somewhere but yeah no definitely Sounds like another one for Fight TV. They must be rubbing their hands at the moment. They could become a big player in the TV market. Well, that is all for this week. We'll be back next week to look back at Lomachenko Lopez and see if George was right or if Deck was right or if we were all just plain wrong. Please do join us then. <laughs>